Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 13 of Stroke Cast. I've got some exciting news this week. I'm actually on local TV. The local uh, NBC affiliate, King 5, in partnership with Swedish Medical Center, where I lived for a month last summer, is actually doing a series of videos they're calling the Medical Minute, which highlights the connection between patients of Swedish and the care team at Swedish. And one of the stories that they are choosing to highlight is mine. So I am now actually appearing on video with one of my inpatient occupational therapists, the always awesome Olivia. You can actually see this video airing on local TV here in Seattle, or you can just go over to strokecast.com slash video. Please check it out. I am really thrilled with how this turned out. It's, it's amazing how they can take an hour and a half of recorded interview content and demo video and all of this other stuff and cut it down to a one minute piece that tells a really great story. So you can check that out over at strokecast.com slash video. So this week, I want to start with a story. I have an event coming up in a couple of weeks where it is going to be appropriate for me to wear a tie. Now, I live in Seattle and I've worked in the tech industry for much of my career, which means that wearing a tie is something I just generally don't do. I haven't worn a tie since my stroke and really I haven't had any reason to wear a tie since then. I think I've only worn a tie maybe twice in the past three years. It's just not something that's common in Seattle. Uh, I'm no stranger to ties, though. I, I spent 16 years in Catholic schools, so I wore a tie for all of grade school, learned to tie it myself by the time I got to junior high, and then all through high school. And by the time I got to college, well, I wasn't wearing a tie every day, but on the speech and debate team, we would travel to tournaments throughout the Northwest, and at any tournament, that typically meant also wearing a tie. But now I have a decision to make. Because I have this event coming up where I'll be wearing a tie, I need to do one of two things. I either need to practice and learn a new skill, that of tying a tie with just one hand, or I can go shopping and get a nice high quality clip-on tie that I don't have to actually tie myself. Now, the clip-on actually seems like the easiest solution. It also seems like it's an inherently temporary solution to not being able to use this skill I've had for most of my life. Now, learning to tie a tie one-handed means I can, of course, use my existing collection of ties. It also means I would be acquiring a new skill and developing some new motor skills but I would be developing those motor skills for the hand that already works and doesn't necessarily need to acquire a whole lot of new skills. It also seems like it would be more of a long-term solution, uh, something I would be planning for the next 5 to 10 to 15 times I wear a tie, which could easily take 20 years. In some respects, learning to tie a tie one-handed feels kind of like I'm giving up on going back to being a two-handed tie tire. So this thought process, and one which I am clearly overthinking, did manage to spur a bunch of thoughts about things like adaptive gear and neuroplasticity and the idea of learned non-use. When I was in the hospital, I began dealing with shoulder subluxation. I talked about this in a previous episode. You can go back and listen to that at strokecast.com slash sublux. Basically, with sublux, you aren't using your shoulder muscles, so they sort of give up working. And the weight of your arm gradually starts to pull it away from its socket. There are a couple of problems with this. Recovery becomes much more painful and difficult because the bones and muscles and tendons and things aren't lining up the way they're supposed to. 
And that's one of the reasons why it's so important, uh, especially in the early days after stroke, to make sure you actually support that arm, whether that's resting the arm when it's not in use on a pillow or on a uh, couch cushion or on a table so that you're actually taking the weight off of the shoulder. One way I like to think about it is it's sort of like there are competing work orders within the body. One part says, okay, we need to get these nerves rewired and restore the connection to that weak limb. Meanwhile, there's another team in the body which is saying, well, we're not using that limb anymore, so let's just get rid of it. The brain is highly efficient or lazy, depending on how you want to look at it. And it wants to just sort of execute common tasks like opening and closing your hand uh, based on some pre-established patterns. And of course, in the case of uh, stroke, a lot of those pre-established patterns get wiped out. In his book, The Brain's Way of Healing, Dr. Norman Deutsch uh, repeats the phrase, cells that fire together, wire together. Basically, the more we use a set of nerve cells to do a task, the more commonly they work together, the stronger the connection among those nerve cells will become, the deeper and more ingrained that connection and that pattern will be established. One of the things that occurred to me is that the brain works essentially as a series of dirt roads across a field. It starts out as a flat, clean, pristine field, but as we do things, the pathways and the roots across that field from one part to another get deeper and deeper and more sharply defined. Eventually, we have these ruts that really show us where we go and how to get from one place to another to the point where we don't have to actually think about it. You just sort of put the car in the rut and let it go. In the case of stroke or other TBI, it's sort of like a rainstorm comes along and washes out those dirt roads. Suddenly, a big chunk of that network, a big chunk of those roads are no longer there. And now the brain is no longer able to communicate with other parts of the body because those pathways are gone. You know, now I can't move my fingers because the road that carries those instructions is just not there anymore, and I have to make a new one. Physical therapy and occupational therapy is all about rebuilding those dirt roads and redigging those ruts through repeating the same task and the same movement over and over again starts to carve those new ruts into the dirt roads. That's why technique matters. You see, learning to walk again is great, but if my gait is too wonky and inefficient and I'm swinging my leg out the wrong way or hyperextending too much, that can cause problems long-term, obviously, in those joints. But the more and more I do that, the deeper that pattern gets ingrained in my brain, the deeper those ruts are formed in the dirt road. So essentially, those ineffective motions become the definition of the proper motion in my brain, which makes longer-term recovery even more challenging. It's sort of why habits can be so hard to break and why it's important to avoid forming bad habits to begin with. The brain builds these ruts, these pathways around the things that we repeat, not around the things that are best for us. The patterns we'll establish are the patterns we do again and again and again, not the patterns that are optimized for long-term health. Let's talk a little bit now about learned non-use. As we go about recovery, one of the ways to go through life is to, you know, figure out how to make do. It's to go out and acquire all sorts of adaptive equipment so that we can work around our disabilities, so that we can figure out other ways to do everything. And you know what? That can be great. And there's a lot of value in me learning how to do everything with my right hand only, since my left one doesn't do those things yet. And if I wasn't expecting to get my left hand back at some point, that would absolutely be the right way to approach it. 
but I hope that's not the case. In learned non-use, I would essentially be telling my brain through my actions that I don't plan to use my left arm. Instead, I would go ahead and develop all these new ruts in the dirt roads for doing things right-handed only, and over time, those patterns become more and more deeply ingrained and in just the way that I do things. My brain would essentially give up on my left arm. It would learn not to use it, and that lesson can prevent further recovery. See, and that's the downside to a lot of adaptive gear that's out there. Do we view it as a temporary or a permanent solution? And that's one reason why my OTs, my occupational therapists, tell me to use my left hand for as many things as I possibly can, like trying to eat or turn lights on and off or for turning doorknobs because we don't want my brain to give up on it. We don't want my brain to forget that, hey, there is this other limb there that might not be terribly useful right now, but could be useful in the future. But I got to use it in order to reinforce that message and make sure that I develop some of those new roads and those new ruts. Yeah, it's hard. And yeah, it's going to take thousands of repetitions of those actions to build those new patterns. No one said any of this was going to be easy. One approach of dealing with the challenges of learned non-use is based on the research of Edward Taub from the University of Alabama. It's called constraint-induced movement therapy. Basically, the idea of this approach is to prevent the patient from using the unaffected limb, in my case, my right hand, and forcing the patient to use their affected limb, their weaker one, for all tasks throughout the day. For up to 90% of waking hours, constraint-induced therapy will actually go ahead and prevent the use of the good arm. This forces the patient to learn to use the affected limb and, and to do all sorts of different things. And obviously, this is challenging, and it may not always be safe or feasible, especially in an outpatient context. And there are variations of the therapeutic approach that can address this. But the core idea is that the best way to learn to use the affected limb or to relearn how to use the affected limb is to actually use the affected limb. And as I said, this takes thousands of repetitions. And, and thinking about those thousands of reps also called to mind the idea of rote memory. Sort of like, you know, when we were kids and had to learn our multiplication tables uh, by rote memory to actually just have all of this data memorized, to repeat it again and again until we have it memorized. And a lot of people hate the idea of learning that way in school. The idea of straight memorization seems frustrating and counterintuitive to a good learning experience. And as I work with people in adult education and learning and development, I, I see a lot of this reluctance as well to focus on memorization and rote memory. You know, people think this is just not the best way to learn stuff. And yet what we are learning through neurology and neuroplasticity and stroke recovery is that rote learning, thousands and thousands of repetitions, is how we build those new neural patterns and how we carve those new ruts in the road. It really makes me think more and more about have we been too hard on the concept of rote learning? Is this something that needs a, hot, a more prominent role in general education? I've been thinking about a lot of those things lately. But back to my tie. What did I decide to do? I think I'm going to go with the clip-on until I can use both hands again. Acquiring that one-handed tie-tying skill for such a rare task implies to me that it will be years until I can use both hands again, and I'm just not willing to accept that yet. Now, my opinion on this might change in a week or a month, and I could certainly go back and forth on this idea, but for now, I think the idea of going to the clip-on is the best way to get the results I need in the short term while still not letting my brain off the hook of relearning how to use my left. And that brings us to our hack of the week, which is to pre-thread your belt into your pants. As I started becoming more and more mobile and leaving the apartment, I had to, of course, start using a belt in my jeans again. Uh, 
the challenge is that after I managed to get dressed, at first I didn't have the flexibility or the balance to be able to stand up and reach with my right hand all the way around my waist on the, my left side to be able to thread the belt properly. And it took me a little while to figure out how to do this safely. Uh, the ultimate conclusion I came to is that the best way to do it in those early days was to make sure I put the belt through my belt loops before I put on my jeans. That way, once I did put them on and, and fasten the button, the belt was already there and I could just fasten it as normal. This made it a heck of a lot easier and made the process of getting dressed a heck of a lot faster. So if you're struggling to thread a belt through your belt loops while wearing your clothes, try threading the belt through, the, through those loops before you actually put on the pants. And that's it for this week. What are your thoughts on learned non-use and adaptive equipment? Go ahead and let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash tie. Be sure to check out the video that Olivia and I appear in over at strokecast.com slash video. If you have an Amazon Echo device in your home, go ahead and enable the Strokecast skill. Just go up to it and say, Alexa, enable Strokecast. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you next week. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.